Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. You know, we're really glad that you're with us this morning. We're glad that you're up, sun's up, everything is doing great this morning. And we have Mr. Edmund Dwayne Jordan, who is an attorney and a politician. He's a Democratic member of the Louisiana House of Representatives from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Sir, I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing well. Good, 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 good. So tell me first, um, how did you get on the board or how did you get interested in the on this credit union? Well, you know what? It's a... Uh... I guess a long process, but what happened initially, um, when I came out of law school, I was interested in actually creating a credit union. And there was a group in Mississippi that did this with a, a group of churches. And so what they did was, uh, the pastors got together and they, uh, created a co-op and they, they got all the congregation to, to contribute to it and become members. Mm -hmm. And what they did, um, because they, you know, minorities didn't have access to capital at that time. And, and uh, frankly, we still have some challenges with that now, but they, uh, they wanted to make sure that they had access to capital. So what they did was they created uh, their own credit union, uh, had some members run it and they created that access to capital that they needed. Now there was another group that did something very similar but instead of creating the uh, credit union, they pooled all their money together and then they shopped it to different financial institutions. And part of their conditions was, uh, look, whoever's going to give the best rates to our members for car loans, for business loans, for home loans, then that's where we're going to uh, park our money. And, you know, these churches had some significant offerings doing, you know, on a monthly basis. So... Uh, we're talking about millions of dollars a year that they figured out that they could collectively pool and leverage to uh, better their community. That's fantastic. I mean, particularly that's an asset that most often churches don't know that they have that kind of power that they can yeah, sell and so, the institution. Yeah, that's right. So this is back in like 1998. And then um, so I tried something to to. to get a group of pastors uh, in Louisiana to do the same thing, but they weren't very hot to the idea at the time. And so fast forward to 2012, and I've been a member of uh, the credit union that I'm now on the board of. I've been a member of it all my life. It started off as Dow Louisiana Federal Credit Union, and my father uh, was a uh, an employee there and has since retired, but um, I always had been a part of it all my life. And at one of the annual meetings, they had an opening. And just so happened, I was there and somebody nominated me and was able to, uh, fortunate enough to be elected to be on the board. And I've been on the board ever since. So your father was working for the credit union? Well, he was working for the company that started the credit union. And actually, he was very instrumental back in 1976 in forming the credit union because he worked in the HR department. Uh, when the credit union was actually formed, so he didn't directly work for the credit union, but his company was the uh, was the founder, the founders of the credit union. So the good news and what I was going to bring up is you've been in it all your life. You've know, un understood credit unions and the value of credit unions and a cooperative. I didn't learn about them until I was about fifty five. So yes, yeah, great. yeah. So no, I've been, yeah, I've been involved pretty much from uh, yeah as, as long as I've been able to. My all my adult life, and probably you know even as a teenager. Okay, so you went to school in Baton Rouge, also. Went to college in Baton Rouge, Southern University, uh, 
A&M College, and I went to law school there as well, one of only, I think, four or five, at the time, only four African-American or HBCU law schools. And uh, when I was at undergrad, I'm proud to say we were the largest HBCU in the country. I taught at Howard for a few years, and I thought Howard was the largest. I didn't... Well, La- Howard is the largest now, but uh, but back then, I think we had Howard by probably a thousand or a couple thousand students at the time. Now, we still are the only uh, HBCU that has a system. Though. So uh, we have uh, the Baton Rouge campus. We have the Shreveport campus. We have the New Orleans campus. And then we also have the, the, the Ag Center, the Law Center, and the Nursing School. So you're kind of proud of your school, huh? I'm not going. I'm not going to fight you about it. Mine is. I blue. am. I, I am. Right. I graduated from Bluefield State <laughs> College. There was an article ten or years ago, the whitest HBCU. The whites took it over in West Virginia, and so I think we oh, the wow. most we had was two thousand students, and so I think it's down to a thousand again. What it was when I was going there, but it it, it gave me a good education to keep on and got a. Masters in math and an MBA after that, so it's a great foundation. Um, well, look, I, you know what we we kid and jest, but you know I, I support all our uh, of our HBCUs. I, I think that's a uh, whichever one you went to. I think whether it's public or private, I think it's just a great way to get an education. Yeah, because the faculty and the staff they they were there for you. They knew why they were there. Absolutely. And that's what they were there for it was. Absolutely. Member support in a way, student support, just like this credit union is members. They're for the members, not there to make money. You have to make money, but that's not the main focus. That's right. That's not the main focus. All right. So you went to law school, and what did you do after law school? Well, immediately after law school, I went and worked for an insurance defense firm. But while I was in law school, I worked for legal aid. And so that's sort of. You know, my, my heart has always been in serving the public and, and you know, consumer-oriented. So I only did the, the insurance company for a couple of years and then went on to work in state government. I worked for the Louisiana Public Service Commission. I worked for DEQ. And then uh, right after Hurricane Katrina, I worked for the Department of Homeland Security for a couple of years. Yeah, and so then I went into private practice right after that. Okay. So you've always wanted to work for the people, particularly, you said, in um, sort of the economic realm and consumer protection. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been one of my focus. All right. So then you s- decided sometime along the way to go into the government to become an elected official. How did that happen? Yeah, well, when I when I worked at the Public Service Commission in Louisiana, the Public Service Commissioners are elected, and we only have five throughout the state. And at that time, the Public Service Commission was known as a launching pad for, for officials who wanted to become governor at some point. So, we we've had quite a few Public Service Commissioners that became governor. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, the, the the last Public Service Commissioner that became governor was uh, Kathleen Blanco and. Uh, having her services today, she uh, she passed away on Sunday. Mm, sorry, um, but uh, well, thank you. But so while I was there, I sort of kind of saw how uh, politics worked from the inside, and then decided, uh, you know, I said I can do this, and and so that sort of developed the itch. And then uh, in 2016, I was fortunate enough to be elected to the House of Representatives. So are you still focused on consumer protections? Is that your main focus in, in the government? It's part of, it's part of that. So, um, you know, we've, we've done some things in the area of um, Internet privacy. Uh, I serve on the Commerce Committee, so Commerce deals a lot with uh, consumer affairs and consumer protection. So, uh, so we're doing those, some of those things. And, and while I was at the Public Service Commission, we actually started the Do Not Call program we were, uh, I think we were probably the third in the nation to do that, uh, along with the FTC and the FCC. So, again, just sort of been always involved in, in consumer protection and uh, consumer affairs. Okay. In that capacity, have you seen any opportunity to help start or reasons to help start co-ops like worker co-ops or any other kind of co-ops? You know what, frankly, you know what, the the opportunity really has not presented itself. 
what I would tell you, um, the main thing that I've been fighting from the consumer side is the pre- is predatory lending. In Louisiana, we have a high rate of poverty, and these predatory lenders uh, are certainly taking advantage of that. And so the last two years, I've been fighting them, but I will tell you they have a fairly strong lobby, but, um, but we're going to continue that fight. So as far as the consumer uh, protection in the financial services arena, the, uh, the biggest issue we sort of had was with the, um, with the payday lenders and the predatory lenders. What, what's come here on this show is, which I didn't realize is a major problem, too, are your dollar stores. The dollar okay. stores are they're coming up in all kinds of communities, normally communities where there's uh, low income poverty. And so they end up mm-hmm. selling foods with no no nutrients, but they're cheap. So, right. Well, yeah, we um, uh, in, in the district that I represent, um, we're fighting the food deserts right now. You know, we, we have some of the same issues and we're trying to recruit, you know, real grocers over to, to the uh, to the area. But but you're right. And in, in impoverished communities, it's very hard to uh, to get these guys. And then what we have here in Louisiana as well, that these guys are, are, are doing that. And then they're also serving alcohol. So uh, not only are you getting food with very few nutrients, you're getting a lot of the uh, the alcohol included with that. Well, it's amazing how uh, folks trying to make money will come and prey on folks that don't have money. That's always been interesting to me. So well, I'm about to say that's a, that that story certainly isn't isn't new. <laughs> so we just got to figure out a way to combat that, though. So. What I want to talk to you some more about on here is how, how to combat that food deserts with food co-ops. It's how it's okay. happened in several different places. You know about the credit unions. And then in uh, Madison, Wisconsin and New York City, uh, the government has put forth Madison, I think, is a million and a half a year for five years. And in New York, it's two and a half million a year to start worker co-ops to create the jobs. So I want to talk more about these opportunities and talk a little bit about the values and principles of co-ops and why it works for people that don't have money. And on this show, a lady from the International Cooperative Alliance uh, told me, Mr. Jordan, that co-ops have people come out of poverty with dignity. So that's what I want to come back and talk about. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. News Talk, 1450 AM WOS and 95.9 FM. Information is power, and that's why the National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program to give you information to help to start a cooperative, to solve your community problems, or to locate a co-op to go work with them and perhaps even work for them. And today we have Mr. Edmund Dwayne uh, Jordan on the phone with us. And Mr. Jordan, when you announced your candidacy in 2016, you said you want to set the state budget in line with the priorities that enhance opportunities, not diminish them. So that's what I want to talk about, because it said co-ops help people come out of poverty with dignity, and that's a way of enhancing opportunity. What are some of the things that you've been able to do to help that, to, to make this that, that statement come true? Well, what we've done... Um Several things. So we were able to uh, pass a bill that created the North Baton Rouge Economic Development District. It was a bill actually authored by uh, uh, one of our state senators, Regina Barrow, who her Senate district overlaps with my uh, House district. And so together, we we all, a group of us, were able to to get that passed. And so we are, are looking at the food deserts. We're looking at access to capital. We're looking at several areas, but but also with our um, 
governor that's in office right now, one of the, I mean, the first thing he did is expand Medicaid. So we did the Medicaid expansion. We we funded early childhood education. We funded uh, folks having access to benefits. And so we, we've created, or at least trying to create an atmosphere and an opportunity now where all Louisianians can, uh, can, can reach their dreams and goals. Right on. Fantastic. So this March, I went up to a, it's called an up and coming conference talking about those communities that are starting food co-ops. And a lot of times you won't get the big box stores in, uh, just like uh, in the thirties, they couldn't get the capital organizations to put up lines, electrical lines. So they had to start a rural electric co-ops uh, right. to, to do, put that investment in and do that work. And a lot, a lot of times it was sweat equity. So food co-ops can happen the same way. And this, this up and coming conference is a way of getting that. If you can get five, 10 people to want to start a food co-op, then they can get the training they need. They can get some seed monies and maybe some of that state budget can help them start a food co-op or even put the monies to build the building and lease it back to them. And therefore the people in the community will have the say of what is stocked in that, in that food and maybe working with farmers to bring in. Uh, you have a lot of farmers in Louisiana. <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> to bring that uh, from the from the farm to the table through the co-op. That's right. That's right. So that's so, one way. And, and, I, like to- and I was going to say that. Yeah, that would be great if we could do some farm to table initiatives and work with uh, work with farmers to make some things happen. That, was, that really would be a great idea. So I don't have it with me right now, but I want to get you information about that up and coming conference and the people that are doing that. And the uh, Community Development Foundation, CDF uh, dot co-op, they have some grant monies to help uh, food co-ops get started. They've also been very effective in helping uh, worker owned co-ops. Uh, those co-ops, I think you got some old folks in Louisiana too, and they might need some people to come and, and, and work with them, uh, in their homes to, so they can stay in their homes longer. And so they're starting co-ops with people that do that kind of work and the workers own it. Okay. Might be interesting well, or something like that. That, that. that is, you know, and you, you know, I'm sitting here and you're giving me some great ideas, uh, something, you know, that, that we could start, but I'm also thinking about, uh, back to your initial question, what type of legislation can we introduce to make uh, these efforts uh, less cumbersome and, and to try to aid and assist in making some of these things a reality? Yes. And so I, I definitely want to maybe follow up offline with you and see how, how we can really uh, make some of these things happen. Well, that's why I was excited about talking to you, because looking at your background and what you've been doing and what your interest is, where your heart is, it just really fits into this cooperative movement. Uh, So who you are, uh, you may not know, you're a cooperator (laughs) by by your heart and the stated words I've read about you, your 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 life and what you're doing. Um, So let me just tell you, there's four types of co-ops, four basic types. You've got your uh, co-op that's owned and controlled by the employees, and it's called a worker-owned co-op. So any business okay. in Louisiana at all, any business you can think of, could be uh, a worker-owned co-op. Uh, if it's owned and controlled by the consumer, the people that use the product or service, it's called a consumer cooperative. And there's your housing co-ops, your credit unions. There's a health clinic in Madison, Wisconsin that's owned by the patients. So it's just any time that the people that use the products or services, and more often than not, your food co-ops are consumer co-ops. They're owned and controlled by the people that shop in in that uh, store. Sometimes the food co-op could also be a worker co-op, and I've known a couple of them. They're hybrids. They're owned by both the consumer and the employee. Uh, um, and then so the, the third type is where your farmers have been using the most, but artists are beginning to use it. Uh, that is when it's a purchasing co-op. So when people come together and the farmers have been doing it since the 30s and 40s and the Department of Ag knows most about co-ops because of it, they come together and they buy their products 
together until they're buying in bulk. Because they're buying in bulk, they get a lower price and they have people working in a co-op that understands that business and they can negotiate better contracts and better pricing. Uh, so you, that's your, your, your purchasing co-op. But Ace Hardware is an example. These different stores belong to the co-op and they buy in bulk so they can compete against the big box stores, the Home Depots and Lowe's and all of those folks. Then you, on the other side of the farm, you get your marketing co-ops and some of them call producers. Some people call them producer co-ops. And they, all of these farmers will sell their products to the marketing co-op and they add value to it or they get that product to market they normally could not get. Ocean Spray is an example, uh, mm-hmm. Organic Valley, uh, Cabot Creamery. Those are all examples of these producer co-ops. So you, you have in different areas, in, in Louisiana particularly, I don't know if you know the Federation of Southern Co-ops. I do not. I okay. have not. They're a bunch of black farmers mostly, and they started in 1967 after the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, what I, the stories I was told was that when they went out to get to vote, the, the white folks would not sell them things like gas. And so they pooled their monies together and they bought a truck and they went across the state line and they bought their gas and they brought it back. Uh, so the, the co-op helped them to be independent. So the, they created the Federation of Southern Co-ops. I forgot. I ju- they just had their annual meeting in um, Birmingham and Epps, Alabama last weekend. I, I went live from there last weekend, last Thursday, and then uh, I went down to their annual meeting. So the, you have these farmers that have come together, and they have they have they represent 17 states and the District of Columbia in this federation, and they have a representative from Louisiana. I did I talked to him last year at their annual meeting, and he was on the show. So I want to get you hooked up with them too. It's a great re- resource to understand about co-ops and figure out how they can do it, and what other communities, particularly in the South are putting together the legislation to form these co-ops so that people can, in fact, like when your father helped to start the uh, credit union, the people will have control over their own lives and their own destinies, and they don't be looking for somebody else. They don't look for a massa or an overseer to yeah, tell, well, tell them what to you do. You know, I, I will say, you, you're giving me, and, and thank you, uh, first of all, for making me aware of, of the organization, but you give me some some great ideas for thought, and 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 one of the things that that comes to mind, um, I, I often speak to young kids, and and look, I mean, you know, we we, we kid around, uh, uh, at least we started kidding around at the very beginning, talking about the universities, how it's uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the university you went to, and all, and 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 I always encourage kids to go to college, and I think that's a great way to uh, to eradicate or at least try to mitigate poverty. But but I also say to to lots of kids these days, um, especially when it comes to the uh, to African American kids, we have abandoned the trades. Yep. You know, so you, it's it's very hard to find African American plumbers and, and and carpenters and electricians and welders, you know, and, and guys in in these professions. And and so when you're talking about that, and I know you're talking about the housing co-ops. And, and although it's slightly different, a different take, it's almost the same thing you're talking about uh, with the farmers. I think these <laughs> trades need to to collaborate and come together and we, try to leverage that opportunity for themselves. I totally agree with you. And we have to take our next break and we'll come right back and talk about the trades and how we can get black kids, particular black, brown people to get back in those trades and make a good living. We'll be right back. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. And Mr. Jordan is our guest. He's with the House of Representatives, uh, representing Baton Rouge in the uh, in Louisiana. Sir, you were talking about the trades and getting blacks to get more. We've we've lost that. And I and I have yeah. it that 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 I've talked to some people in Flint, and I haven't gone out to Newark yet. 
but if we could get those plumbers in there to to help re re plumb these houses, there's lots of money that can be made, and they don't have to bring in a non black and brown people to do the work <laughs> or to make, to yeah, make well, the money. <laughs> I'll tell you, tell you what, there are there are plumbers that are making as much as doctors and lawyers and and other professions. And, I mean, and that's what it is. It's a it's a it's a trade, but it's also a profession. And and I think what happens is. I think in our in our zeal uh, to to have our kids, you know, pursue for, a formal education. Look, like I'm a father of two kids. I I do the same thing, so I'm at fault with it. But in, in our effort to to say, hey, look, go to college, uh, get a master's, get a PhD, get a law degree, get a MD or whatever else you, you know it is, we sort of uh, abandon those other areas. And and you know, at the end of the day, it's about legally providing a living for your family and and those uh, trades provide opportunities for that and and I think if we if we had more of that um we could actually recycle more money through our um through our economy through our communities yeah and our economy so we can build yeah. up our own communities um exactly that's one of the other pluses of co-ops in a community the people that that own the business and live in the community and they, they spend their money in the community. So the money may turn five to eight times in a, in a community where co-ops ownership is. Whereas, you know, in most, uh, poor communities, low income communities, it may turn one time. They get it and then spend it outside the community. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it doesn't build up. Yeah. I, I think getting, See, I like to get plumbers and painters. I I do property management as my day work. So I do find mm-hmm. blacks in Washington, D.C. that are in these trades, uh, blacks, Hispanics, people of color and, and all of these trades. But it's kind of like instead of being one by yourself and doing this and having your own individual trucks, what if three, four, five plumbers got together and started their own business and they could have somebody doing the administration and uh, getting loans or whatever they they need to get? The same thing for, for painters and so forth. It, it, it's pool, pool whatever resources you have like the farmers have done, and then you can get more jobs and charge more money, make more money. Uh, and so forth. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I think there's a lot of ways for blacks and brown people to make money in the United States. Going to college is only one. Only That's one. it. You're right. So what other kinds of things? I, I know you're you're on a chamber of commerce. And you're really into how to create wealth for folks because this, this gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Forty-seven. Right. Well, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I started to say forty-seven percent of Americans could not come up with four hundred dollars if they had an emergency that cost four hundred dollars. So, like half the population have no savings. Right. And, and well, I tell you, I just think that um, you know having capital is is one thing, and, and having access to capital is another. Now, ultimately, you'd like to have both, but um, historically. Uh, we have not had access to capital, and I think it's, it's been that that prevention, whether through redlining or other means, that's prevented us from building wealth. If you and I have the same great idea and we're starting from zero, and you have no money to fund your idea, but I can go to a, a bank or a credit union and they'll give me a ten thousand dollar loan to start my idea, well, I've got the advantage. And I think historically, what's happened is. We've had as, as as great of ideas as anybody else, but what's happened is we've never necessarily had the access to capital to execute on those ideas and make them a reality, where the where other folks could. And so when you when you're placed in that type of situation, you know it's not hard to come to the conclusion or, or to see why we are where we are. Yep. Yep. I taught marketing at Howard, and I would teach sales, and I would teach management uh, classes. And I would tell students that, um, you know, I can teach you the numbers, and I can teach you how to make a decision or how to make choices, but what I cannot teach you, and this is the other upper hand that white folks have had a lot longer, is I can't teach you when you're looking across the table with somebody and they say they can do X, that they can really do X. And they can not only, that can they do it, but they will do it. That's what gets to be difficult, and that's you know when you're sitting on your granddaddy's knee and he's cutting deals, 
then you learn that stuff. <laughs> and it's harder exactly. to learn it. So sometimes it, it that, that's that by itself can be a deterrent from making that idea that you were talking about, that good idea of making it come to life. And the other thing I've found out having my own business is you just don't know all of the different ways that the society around you could help you in making that idea come to fruition. Not only the capital, but just the, the inspiration and pats on the backs and that a boy or, hey, let me call somebody that they, they may want to buy that thing. Uh, there's so many different ways that helping somebody be successful and so many ways if you don't want them to be successful that you can kill it. Yeah, you know, and I think that's just us uh, being able to expand our networks. So um, so I think I think that's the that's the issue that that we have. I think if we can if we can broaden our networks and and, uh, and and I think that now I will say I think that's part of the advantage, though, of uh, of HBCUs. Yep. Because I can tell you in Bad Rouge, that's one of the things that we found. So, I mean, you know, we have a, a great engineering school. So kids come up, you know, uh, people that are teachers, no engineers, or uh, they know folks that are in marketing. So you do have all these, um, I guess, built-in uh, mechanisms and systems that help us to do that. But again, like you said, at the end of the day, it's getting your idea in front of the right person that can help you or at least guide you to somebody that can do this. And, and historically, again, we, we've had that disadvantage, but, but I think that's starting to come around. I mean, you look at anybody, I look, we, I, I serve with, you know, second and third generation legislators. So like you said, if they've been sitting on their grandfather's knee or their dad's knee, knowing how the system works and knowing how to cut the deals, well, they're going to be more efficient at doing that. They have somebody that they can go to for counsel and advice that's been through it already to know that knows how to make this happen. Whereas, you know, we sort of start from scratch, but uh, we can't let that deter us or, or, or be an excuse for us not to be successful. I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. This is the other thing I like about co-ops. I told you I was just down in, in Alabama at the Federation of mm -hmm. Southern Co-ops. And so you've got somebody from Mississippi, Louisiana, you got Texas, you got Georgia, you got Florida, you got all of these different places in the room and people are sharing ideas. They're talking to each other about what happened, what what worked, what didn't work, and how you can get get assistance from whether it's the federal government or from the credit union or wherever to make this thing work. And that's I found in co-ops getting information out is one of the things people really cherish doing, helping each other. The values of co-ops are honesty, integrity, uh, well, honesty, openness, uh, social responsibility, and caring for one another. And that caring for one another, I find it really, really helps in co-ops. Same thing at that up-and-coming conference with all of these new people, and they'll bring in people that already, you know, operate in food co-ops. So you get the new people with old people, and they're sharing ideas of what happens, what works, what goes, what's your feasibility study look like, what's your marketing plan, what's your business plan. So that's one of the things I like about co-ops. It's their fifth principle, and that is education, training, and information, and sharing it, working with each other. Tell you what, it sounds like something. Uh, I have a friend of mine that's in the, in the credit union movement, and we always joke uh, there's certainly a difference between the credit union movement and the credit union industry. And so uh, we have to uh, make sure that the the movement isn't, excuse the pun, but isn't co-opted by the industry because you have people that are that are in this, but they're not part of the sharing. They're not part of the cooperative. They're in it for the competition. And so to me, sometimes uh, those things work against each other, especially like in the financial services industry where, um, where you have, you know, people by, by its very nature, it's a competitive industry. Um, but as co-ops, we are supposed to be sharing information and trying to help one another. Right, right. Well, I'm seeing that right. in in whether it's credit unions or or your uh, rural electric co-ops. It seems like there almost needs to be a sort of a monetary, a, 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 some organization that look at them and see if people are really following the principles of co-ops and the, and the values to make things work. And when they work. When the principles are working and people are working together, it really, really works. It's phenomenal how well it works. And well, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say, no, you know what? They, 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 I mean, look, we've had several success stories, and it's all because of, of this movement. Like, I, you know, originally talked about the, the guys in Mississippi who did this. It worked. It's worked extremely well for them, and it achieved, the, you know, their goals. Um, we just have to have more of that. We have to have people more willing to trust each other. I think trust is one of the biggest parts of, of the co-ops. And, and so if we can get people to trust each other, I think that certainly helps in making it work. Well, you hit the nail on the head. I've, I've heard this over and over again, this word trust. Uh, whenever you start in any kind of a business, particularly a co-op, because you're depending on each other. The, the, the members make the decisions, so they have to trust each other that they're going to be making decisions that's best for everybody and not just for themselves. And again, when it works, I'm, I, I, and that's what caused me to fall in love with this model, uh, Mr. Jordan, was this watching people, maybe not a high school degree, at best a high school degree, that make complicated decisions, and they they, they do it with such ease and common sense. They, and there may be some conflict going on, but they just they iron it out. And then they come together, vote, and they move it. Yeah, it works. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. So I got that you have an insurance company. You are a lawyer. You work for the the government. And the focus is on how to help people get a, get better, have a better quality That's of it. life. How's That's it work? the goal. How's it working for you now? You know, it's, it's working pretty good right now. Uh, I must say, I can't complain too much. So we are, um, you know, with with the insurance, uh, you know, again, one of those areas that uh, you, it's a need. You have to have it in certain areas where, you know, if you own a vehicle, it's mandatory in Louisiana that you have insurance. But it's really trying to provide a service to the community to uh, to make sure everybody can have access to it. So. We, what I've tried to do is wrap a couple of different services under one umbrella, not necessarily a one-stop shop, but again, uh, guiding people in the right direction, educating them on what their options are so that uh, once they have the information, they can make the best decision for themselves. All right. We're going to take our final break. And what I'd like to do in this last break is see if we can put our thinking hats on to how we can take some of this information about co-ops and, you know, get down and say, okay, here, here's an idea. We could do X to help people out. We could create a food co-op. We could create maid service co-ops. We could create a farming co-ops, but how to get people in Baton Rouge to where they're working. I, I assume you don't have zero empl- unemployment. No, we always got, we always can improve on employment. <laughs> okay, we'll be right back. All right. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, W.O.S. 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. The National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program. And uh, Edmund, we we've been on the show air now. This October will be six years, and we were only going to do it for one month. And NCB came up; they've been an inspiration for us. Their mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities. Louisiana, <laughs> by providing innovative financial and related services. So that might be a partner for you, uh, National Cooperative Bank in in uh, Louisiana, but also from the Federation of Southern Co-ops, Bruce Harrell, H-A-R-R-E-L-L, is an outreach specialist in Louisiana. And I think his office is in New Orleans, but I've got to, I'm have got i going to find that out and get it to you. Uh, where he's I appreciate located. that. First of all, Congratulations to y'all making six years. Thank you. <laughs> I, just, I love it. I never thought I would be a radio personality. If that's some people said have told me uh, I have a radio voice, I never expected that. And I just love talking about co-op for the things and the reasons we've been talking about here. This the only thing that I have seen, Edmund, that will help black folks and brown people 
come out of poverty. I mean, they're not going to redistribute wealth. They gave folks 40 acres in a mule. I think I heard that some people got 40 acres of mule and then they got them drunk and took it back or did other kind of legal maneuvers to t- take that land back. Uh, the Federation of Southern Co-ops, other portion is land retention. That's what they work on is helping blacks to keep their land. So they're not going to give us anything. So it's a, how do we make it? And this, this is the only way I've seen economically this, this model to help us get out and really learn how to run a business and run a business, make a profit and raise your families and so forth. So what do you think you might be able to do there, sir? Well, you know what? Um, I'm doing a break. I was thinking, and, and I think that the, the, the most immediate need is the food co-op. You know, we, we get with uh, Mr. Harrell. We work with the farmers. We try to figure out a, a farm to table approach and, uh, and try to help the communities. I mean, whether it be through farmers markets or a, uh, you know, a permanent everyday grocery store. Yeah, it could be it could be um, a farmer's market. And in some cases, they'll start with they have so many families, let's say 50 families, 100 families that spend ten dollars a week, a month or something. And they package uh, veggies, fruits and vegetables and to give to this to this family. It could start like with no overhead, but a way of just right. organizing and getting f- fresh fruits and vegetables on on the plates on these ki- children's plates and give them the nutrition they need. And it could then end up being a storefront. Uh, normally, they're not as big as the big box stores, uh, Kroger's and Piggly Wiggly's and Giants and all Soup and Subway and all of those. But the residents, the members, say what gets stocked on those shelves. And the members, if there is a profit, the members decide what that happens to that profit. And, Dwayne, what I've heard is that most Oregon, most co-ops, they have three pots. They have how much stays in the business for growth, how much goes in the community for community projects, gifting money to help children get a better education or whatever that, that community needs. And the third pool is for go back to the members in some form of a dividend or patronage. And for a food co-op, a lot of times that is, you get so much credit on your account that you can go buy more and more food and not have to pay for it but through this profit sharing. So it's a right. phenomenal well, way. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's a, no, I, just, I think that's a, that's a great way to, to, to at least start and, and get the ball rolling. And, uh, because the need is there. I mean, that's the, you know, that's one of the immediate needs. And so I think if we can uh, address that, at least we get the ball rolling. I mean, I don't. I don't think that's something that you you you, you eradicate or you you uh, solve overnight. But um, but I think if we get that ball rolling in that direction, I think we'll we'll be well on our way to uh, fixing one of the problems. It takes two to four years. I think probably more like two to six years, an average three to four years to get a food co-op up and going, and most of that is education. And that, mo- therefore, when you get one up, the likelihood is that it will succeed because people know what they're doing. So then there's a feasibility study that happens, and sometimes there's grant money for that, which I th- told you CDF may have grant money for that to do a feasibility study to look how many people in that neighborhood, what kind of, what kind of, uh, you know, physical plant do you need, how much space do you need, and what kind of equipment do you need in that space, and all of that. And then working with the farmers, and farmers, uh, they like this. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, and I'm, but I'm thinking that even some of the other side industries that may not, you may not necessarily think about with farming or uh, grocery stores that come into play. I mean, uh, I have a friend who has a logistics company. I mean, somebody's got to be able to transport. Uh, whether I mean, the farmer could absolutely do it himself, but if he if he doesn't. And you've got to have somebody that can transport those goods and services from the farm to the, you know, to the store. Sure. Um, so that's just one example, but I'm, I'm sure there are others that I'm not thinking of right now that that could be, uh, you know, could spur off of that and create other industries, other benefits for the community. There is a book. Um, I'm trying to send you this information to the uh, Democracy Collaborative wrote it, and it's called Community Wealth Building. 
And it talks about a lady in New York. Her name was Christina, I believe, in the book. I gave a one-page write-up about her. She was a maid, uh, I think Mexican-American, a maid, and she was making $7 an hour and had two children, single parent. They formed a co-op, and she went to $20 an hour. She went to $20 an hour because they paid her more per hour, but then she also got portions of the surplus. So with 20 bucks an hour, she decided she had a choice now. She decided I'm working less hours, so I spend more time with my children. Okay, and now I can do that because I'm making a lot more money. I'm making three times what I was making. So this is the kind of thing that when you start to then, okay, there's unemployment or underemployment or people are not making a living wage. I like the co-op model better than $15 an hour minimum wage because the, the economics that I taught said if, if, if the capitalist raised from $7 to 15, he's doubled the amount that he's paying his person. He's going to increase the cost of the product and you get, Inflation and that person was making seven could buy a loaf of bread for three dollars. Now he has to pay four fifty or five or six dollars for the loaf of bread. So it doesn't really help. But when they when they get twenty bucks an hour and they haven't raised the the cost of bread or gas and so forth, that basket of goods, then the the per, that's real increase in, in wages. It's real increases in wages. So I like it better. I think co op is the answer, man. I think so too. So, and the, and the name of that book is what again? Communities building wealth. It's on Communities the Communities building wealth. Uh, Democracy collaborative web page and it's the right price is zero. It doesn't cost anything. All right. Can you download it from the website? Yes, absolutely. All right. So we've talked to you about communities building wealth. We talk about uh, CDF, a, a cooperative development fund, uh, to get monies and grant monies and technology for starting a food co-op or in, uh, other forms of uh, worker cooperatives. There's a gentleman I would like to get you to meet out of, he's a deputy mayor of New York, and there in New York is doing a lot in co-ops. He's a brother out of, I, I can't remember, a PhD in urban planning, I think it is. Uh, okay. But I'm going to try to get you his name too so you all could pass notes and, and so forth. But there's a lot going on, sir. I'm so glad that you took time out of your busy schedule to have this conversation yeah. today. I've really enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Ten years ago, I figured out what I want to be when I grow up, and that's to promote and develop co-ops for all the reasons that we just talked about. Anything else you'd like to leave? we got about 30 seconds. Any message you'd like to leave? You know what? No, I, I, just, I just want to thank you for your show and what you're doing and uh, educating the people in the community about what co-ops do and, and what they are. And uh, if, if there's any assistance or any help that I can give in the future, or if there's any way we can collaborate in the future, I certainly appreciate it and hope we can do it moving forward. Let's do it, sir. I look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Same here. All right. Bye Thank now. you. Bye-bye. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, W.O.S. And 95.9.